Hi, this is Jeffrey Reddick, creator of Final Destination, and you are listening to the 80 Slasher Librarian. But remember, the risk of cheating the plan, of disrespecting the design, could incite a fury that could terrorize even the Grim Reaper. And you don't even want to fuck with that mech daddy. Prologue. From Borderlands Patrol, cover date, December 2004. The one with Elvis piloting a flying saucer on the cover. Reaper Furious, Not Just Grim, by Staff Reporter. L.A. rock band The Vipers found themselves dancing with their namesake over the summer. When the club they were playing in collapsed, the disaster has had positive repercussions with Governor Schwarzenegger enacting a review of building codes in Southern California in the wake of the tragedy. So far, so L.A. Times. What the regular newsies didn't print puts a new slant on things that is very different from the straightforward safety issues publicized by the governor. According to the band's semi-official fan club website, further deaths were avoided because lead singer Jess Golden had a clairvoyant experience, allowing her to warn some of the potential victims. The story goes, says Webmaster Skyblaze, that after the disaster, Death was so irritated at this interference that he returned to stalk the survivors, many of whom died shortly afterwards. It's a ridiculous theory, of course, harking back to the so-called Mothman death list, the supposed spate of deaths in the biochemical research industry, or the curse on the archaeologist who opened up Tutankhamun's tomb. It seems a required part of our modern mythology that hit lists crop up after any major events. Thus confident, the Borderlands Patrol set out to debunk the story, and couldn't. It turns out that several prominent survivors of what we might call the Vipers Incident have indeed died brutally in a series of so-called accidents. Club bouncer Sebastian Lebec was immolated in a motorcycle crash, while other survivors perished in bizarre incidents such as falling elevators. The Borderlands Patrol was unable to contact Jess Golden for comment because she is dropped off the face of the earth. Her checking accounts and credit cards haven't been used in over four months. Her ATM PIN number hasn't been used in the same time. She hasn't been seen from or heard of since July. Is she dead? Hiding? Abducted by aliens? Nobody seems to know. Not her fan club, her family, her manager, or, so they say, the police. There is one other possibility. Could she be in protective custody? Or indeed, hostile custody of the federal government? It's not beyond the bounds of possibility. Someone or something arranged a lot of very neat and very specific accidents for her friends. There's one other reason to suspect the motives of the authorities, according to a former LAPD patrolman, who wishes to remain anonymous. The disaster was caused by police incompetence, in the form of, drugs, of a drugs bus gone wrong. The LAPD rubbishes such suggestions, of course, but they would, wouldn't they? Whichever way you look at it, Jess's disappearance has done her career the world of good. Sales of the Viper's single album have tripled since her vanishing, leading some fans to speculate on a publicity stunt. 
but those who knew or knew Jess and the Vipers say that it's not her style and that they believe she is hiding from something, something that killed several of her friends and acquaintances. The Borderlands Patrol has no answers for this mystery, but suggests that if you ever find yourself walking away from an accident, perhaps it's wise to keep an eye over one's shoulder. Chapter 1 Patricia Fuller woke to the sound of rain on the roof. February in L.A., she thought, when the temperature could still be below 70 and the danger of dry brush fires turned to the danger of muddy landslips. You gotta love it, she told herself. Patty forced herself out of bed, barely remembering to switch the coffee machine on before heading to the shower. The steam that gathered in the shower cabinet matched the weather outside. Of all the urban myths Patty had heard over the years, the one most people still seemed to believe in was that it was sunny year-round in L.A. Angelinos seemed to forget the rain about 30 minutes after it had stopped. It was also just about the only urban myth that Patty wished was true. Most urban myths were about bad things, rodents and fast food, violent gang rituals, pet slaughters and supposedly comedic accidents... Patty was tall and athletic with shoulder-length dark hair that thankfully didn't frizz when rushing out to work still damp. After showering, she dressed in black jeans and a black halter top. A leather jacket, black of course, would keep the rain off. The fridge was typically empty. She made a mental note to remember to do some grocery shopping sometime, then mentally round-filed it with all the others she had made over the weekend. Her faithful steed, a little three-door Saturn, would transport her perfectly well to the Cocos. She often passed on Sherman Way. It was one on her way to the 101 and Hollywood Freeway anyhow, so she might as well take advantage of it. She paused by the automobile, looking up at the ashen sky. It was soft, monotone gray, as if the artist who colored in the sky hadn't shown up for work this morning and had just left the bare, firmament showing. Grimacing, she climbed into the vehicle and set off. Normally, she listened to hip-hop while driving, but about 30 seconds of Snoop Dogg today proved that hip-hop and gray rain clouds didn't go together. She stopped the disc and tuned into a news channel for the rest of her trip to Sherman Way. The news didn't entertain her much. It was the usual sound of Iraq, the economy, soccer, and some so-called celebrities bitching at each other. It was so boring as the gray overhead. A half-hour breakfast in Coco's let the traffic on the 101 thin out somewhat. Why sit and stew in the car in a tailback when you can sip coffee and eat pancakes while watching the world go by? Patty watched the road outside, trying to judge from the traffic on the street how good or how bad the traffic on the highway would be. Sometimes she wondered how many of the drivers or passengers were also her readers, and how many would be the subjects of an article by herself or someone like her. Not many in either case, she suspected. They were mundane, and the only borderlands they were likely to cross were on a day trip to Mexico. After enough coffee, she felt hyper enough to face the office and work. The traffic also seemed to have eased, so she left a tip on the table and left. It took another hour to get down to Vine and the offices of the Borderlands Patrol. The entrance was a narrow doorway squeezed in beside a McDonald's half a block along from Man's Chinese Theater. Patty had often wondered how and why the magazine's offices were in the heart of tourist Tinseltown when it had nothing to do with movies, but nobody seemed to know. The rumor was that the offices had been bequeathed to the company by some paranormal believer of a movie star. Since none of the qualifying stars that Patty could think of were dead, she didn't believe a word of it. The offices of the Borderlands Patrol were perfectly normal, comfortable with chairs, pastel carpets, desktop workstations with flat-screen monitors, and not an I-want-to-believe UFO poster in sight. Patty exchanged smiles and nods with various people and writers, sub-editors and artists, as she strolled through to the editor's private sanctum. She rapped on the door, and Matt Lawson opened it. Where have you been? Living life, Patty told him. That's what it's for. The wiry, curly-haired editor grinned. Today, he was wearing a Linkin Park t-shirt. Not here. We're supposed to be professional geeks, Patty. Professional means we should be working 
and geeks means we should, well, you get that one, yeah? I get it. She took a seat and pulled a sheaf of paper from the small rucksack on her shoulder. I've brought along the notes I made on my trip to England. I've still got interviews with the witnesses to transcribe, but I think you'll like the way it's going. Hmm, Lawson said, skimming through the papers. Yeah, it looks like it should make a great spread. Pictures? I've emailed in the JPEGs. The film's in for developing. Cool. Well, while you're waiting, I wondered if you could help me fill a gap in April's issue. As if she was going to turn down some actual paid work. Not in this life. What sort of gap? Four-page spread. Kelly's Echelon Expose has it panned out. Something about a hard drive crash, he says. Patty raised an eyebrow but didn't say anything. Anyways, I was remembering that story of yours looking back at the TR-3 having been tested out of Andrews in the 90s. Yeah, I remember. The most recent albatross around Patty's neck. How could she forget? It's plausible, and there are some things in legit aviation and military magazines that would back it up, but the Air Force still stonewalls my queries, she grimaced. They put me on hold for an hour till I get sick of it and hang up. They lose mail. What about... An FOIA request. You mentioned that before. I did, but you wouldn't authorize the fee as a legitimate expense, and I don't make enough here to be able to spare it out of my own pocket. She hoped her tone, and him having brought up the subject, would combine to solve that problem. Today, I'll authorize it, he replied, sounding only slightly pissed. I've already made an appointment to pick up files from the Civic Center tomorrow. You can go along. All right, she replied not wanting to let him know how ecstatic she was at his turnaround. It didn't do to let people who thought they had influence over you know how you felt. There was only one person she immediately wanted to share her joy with, and she would see him in the evening. This time, she would have to shop for breakfast foods, enough for two. She hoped Will was having at least a good day as she was, rain notwithstanding. Six two, athletic, and with a neat crew cut, Will Sachs looked like he should have been the leader of a bunch of Marines, or perhaps the pitcher for a pro baseball team, rather than the supervisor of the home entertainment section of a Circuit City store in Northridge. His height could have been intimidating, but he was lanky and laid back rather than imposing. He had a square chiseled face and hair that hadn't been in its original brown since the eighth grade. It was five minutes to opening time, and Will was jamming out on an electric guitar that was plugged into the most expensive amp in stock. That was then output to the speakers, concealed throughout the store's ceiling panels. They weren't the best speakers in the world, frankly. They sucked, like a hooker who'd been living on a diet of lemons. But they did play to the whole store, and that was what appealed to him. In five minutes, now four, they'd start excreting the bland lift muzak that kept customers docile or worse, manufactured plastic boy or girl bands. Right now, though, they were all his. Sir? A voice almost dripping with audible acne said behind him. It was the kid in charge of the kitchen appliance section. Uh, Mr. Flanagan is in the parking lot? Will's hand slipped on the steel strings, nearly relieving him of the eternity ring Patty had given him last Christmas. Shit! Panicked, praying that he could get the guitar out of the way before Flanagan, the store manager, saw what was happening. He pulled out the leads from the amp and switched it off. Then, carrying the guitar, ran for the customer service office. There, he switched on the regular loop for the speakers. Then he ran for the staff locker room. He threw the guitar in his locker and the door closed with about five seconds to spare. Flanagan was doing a quick tour of the store when Will got back to the home entertainment department that was his domain. Ready for another day of the war on skin flints, Will? Flanagan asked. Ready and willing, Chief. Good. Let's see a continued upwards progression in targeted retail bullseyes, eh? Uh, yeah, Will agreed, with no idea what the guy was talking about. Will hoped he had meant sell more, because that seemed like the best interpretation that he could think of. Good, good, Flanagan smiled. Get to it, guys. Make me proud. Will flipped the finger at his back. His boss's pride was nothing on earning his paycheck. He straightened his shirt and turned to face the employees of the department. He knew, just by looking at his team, that it was going to be a long day. 
Most of them were college or university students looking to earn an extra buck between classes. Most of them would quit soon to do something they found more interesting, and they already knew that. Knowing it, their hearts wouldn't be in it during this shift, and they'd just be marking time until they could get out of the store and back to having fun. That means they'd screw up and he'd have to work extra to cover for them. Naturally, Will wanted to quit as well. As soon as the band got a gig or a contract that paid more than 500 bucks, he'd be as good as gone as the rest of them. Well, maybe not for just 500. At least he didn't have any sort of age difference issues with the team, as they were all much the same age as himself. The difference between them was that he didn't have enough money or, if truth be told, the inclination to go to college whereas his team just wanted extra fun money. He needed to keep a roof over his head. Independence sucked, he decided. On the other hand, he didn't have to worry about Mom walking in on him and Patty now that he was in his own place. So there was something to be said for it after all. Later, the evening sky was dry and clear, the rain having spent itself as it moved inland. The streets around the city of industry were already dry again, having barely been kissed by the damp weather. A bone-crushing impact slammed Howard sideways, his heart snapping to the right sharply enough to make him see stars. His ears rang from the sound of the collision. Metal screamed in what could be taken for pain by a listener in the right mood, and glass tinkled to the floor pan under the gas and brake pedals, bizarrely audible despite the cacophony all around. The safety straps held, but painfully, and the colorful helmet he wore deflected the glass fragments away from his eyes. Despite all of this, Howe's only reaction was to whoop with delight and enjoy the rush of blood that he could feel throughout every vein in his body. The impact might have been jarring, but it was also exciting, hyping him up to a state where he wanted to leap out of the car and shout, Hell yeah! loud enough to break as many zoning ordinances as he could. Instead, he gripped the steering wheel and twisted it hard, trying desperately to catch up with the armored muscle car that Pete Martin was riding. His helmet kept out some of the engine noise, but there was so much of it that there was really no escape. The whole of the Industry Hill circuit was filled with the roar of thousands or combined horsepower, spreading out over twenty automobiles. The crowd was probably roaring, too. They certainly had been before the race started. Eight thousand people all cheering on their favorite riders, or their favorite marquees, and all imagining that their rider would hear his name and be inspired to win. On the race line itself, even before the engines powered into life, the roar of the crowd was just a general roar. Even a CI spook, whose whole raison d'etre was to analyze the sounds from bugs, wouldn't be able to tell who was shouting what. There was no joy in trying to really work out how many of the crowd was cheering for a given driver, so every driver just told himself that they were all cheering for him. Maybe some of the guys secretly thought that no one was cheering them, but if so, they kept their fears to themselves. The Industry Hill circuit was short for racing cars, it had been intended for bikes, but a demolition derby didn't require long straights of rolling road for speed. In fact, the harder it was to drive without damage, the better. That was why they called it Demolition Derby. Hal was enjoying himself thoroughly by the middle of the race and was tempted to burst into song. He resisted the urge. He had given in once in his debut season three years ago, and the race had been stopped while the fire trucks and paramedics ran rings around his automobile like Indians round the settlers, wagons, and an old western. The pit guys, when they could catch their breath from laughing so hard, had told him that everyone had thought he was on fire because of the noise he was making. Now he only sang in the shower, after the race. He was usually still hopped up on the adrenaline for hours after the race and didn't care what people thought of his singing then. After a day spent in libraries and archives, Patty needed a break. Worse than that, she needed company of the sort that wouldn't mind when she kicked off her shoes and tossed her shirt aside to cool off. That was what friends and lovers were for. She had driven up to Northridge before rush hour, could really get started. Better that than end up trapped downtown for hours. Now her Saturn was pulling into the parking lot of Circuit City. The store was closed, but Patty could hear an unstoppable beat, 
a panzer column of musical notes, driving out from the doors. She went around to the staff entrance and knocked. A moment later, Will Sachs opened the door, singing along to the beat in a bad approximation of German. At first glance, he looked like he might be a jock, but Patty knew he was too interested in kicking back and catching some rays to put in the effort required for athletic pursuits. Ramstein? she asked. He shook his head. Oh, yeah. Better than the crap we put on for the shoppers while the store's open, huh? This is how to put a shitload of the best new speakers to proper use. You know what I mean? It gives me the shits when someone comes in with their significant other to pick up a kick-ass sound system, and I just know they're going to be playing, like, Celine fucking Dion or something. What's wrong with her stuff? It wouldn't be Patty's choice of music to work out to with the speed bags, but she found it relaxing after delivering an article on deadline, on deadline to the minute, rather than the date. Or worse, he went on, some kid coming in to waste one of their collection of Titney CDs. He gave a wistful sigh. Man, these things are made for real music. Like German metal? Or any kind of metal or proper rock music or anything that isn't made on a production line by teeny boppers for other teeny boppers. Patty grinned and kissed him. You done here or do I have to sully my Saturn with your corporate parking lot any longer? One minute, he promised. He was as good as his word as far as Patty could tell returning in exactly what she counted as a minute with his guitar. You take that thing to work? she asked. Wouldn't you? Patty had no idea, having never owned a guitar, nor had the urge to own one. Let's go. I'll find a safe place for your instrument. The next morning, the sun had come out over Santa Monica as the rain had passed on inland overnight. Susan Fries was more than happy about that, as it meant the weather improved as she drove down from Encino through the Sepulveda Pass and west towards the Dauphin Auto Yard. The auto yard was perhaps a rather strange legacy for a father to leave his daughter, but Susan was happy with it. She had never wanted to see the business slip out of the family's grasp, and she had loved tinkering with engines and machines since she was old enough to get her romper suit covered in oil and grease at her dad's side. She hopped out of the Dodge Ram pickup just long enough to unlock the yard's gates and drove in. There was a solid wooden cabin near the gate which contained the yard office, some storerooms, and a wardrobe with Susan's working clothes. At work, she discarded the slacks and velvet shirt in favor of baggy coveralls to disguise her slim legs and not-so-slim hips and breast. She had her near-black hair cut in like a page boy's in an old Errol Flynn movie. There were a couple of brightly colored surfboards propped up in one corner of the office, and she resolved to check them out later in the day. They would need waxing, if nothing else. She had no idea what the weather was going to be like after on, but hoped it would become good enough to strap a board onto the Dodge and head off to the beach in the afternoon. It wasn't as if she had a boss to tell her to keep the place open at any given hour. She busied herself with invoices and bills for the first hour of the day, then decided that the call of fiberglass and wax was too strong to resist. She was halfway through treating the first board, yellow with a red flame motif, when she heard a motorcycle pull into the yard. "'Come on in, Hal!' she shouted without looking up. A moment later, the new arrival walked into the office looking bemused. It was a black man with a buzz cut and a grin wide enough to plow snow on a road in Alaska. His round, owlish spectacles didn't seem to go with the rest of his image. He was wearing plain leathers, black with a hint of silver trim. "'How did you know it was me?' Hal Ward asked. "'You're the only customer I've got with the Kawasaki Ninja ZX-6R.' "'You can't see it from here.' "'I can hear it. You can identify a box by its sound?' "'Yeah?' Susan grinned, her plump cheeks glowing. She could have told him about growing up around engines and how the sound of them and the odor of hot steel were as natural to her as rock and roll and apple pie, but it was more amusing not to. "'What's it today?' Susan asked. "'Was looking for some good old solid shocks,' he said. "'For the Ninja?' "'This is a business call for the muscle car industry heels was sweet.' He rubbed his fingertips under his nose. "'But punishing.' 
When do you need them? Friday. Okay, I was going to wash my hair then, but I think I can manage to dig up some shocks for you. He nodded gently. Actually, your hair's fine, like the rest of you. You keep saying that, but sooner or later, I'm going to have to make you put your money where your mouth is. He looked away and then changed the subject. Uh, are you coming to the next race? I could be persuaded. She tossed him a can of wax. If you can spare an hour or two for the waves, I've got two boards here and there's only one of me. The waves coming into the sand over on Venice Beach, 15 minutes drive from the Dauphin Auto Yard, weren't too big that a beginner couldn't handle. Hal had fallen off the blue and green board three times before Susan finally said, You've never done this before, have you? No, he admitted. Not enough horsepower for my taste, you know what I mean? Susan laughed. Looks like I got me a virgin, huh? Pure as the driven snow. What say I sit this one out and watch an expert in action? And so he did. It was an enjoyable hour, catching some rays, enjoying the beach, and watching an attractive friend in a bikini. Moments like that, he decided are what life is all about. Eventually, she rejoined him soaked to the skin. He handed her a stripy beach robe and nodded out to sea, where a thick charcoal line hugged the horizon. Looks like you're done just in time. Something's coming in for us. More rain. El goddamn Nino strikes again. Hal just smiled and took her hands in his. You're beautiful, you know. No, I'm not. You certainly aren't ugly. Susan waved a hand in a 50-50 gesture. I like to think of it as just pretty enough. Pretty enough? He laughed warmly. Pretty enough for what? Anything specific? She pursed her lips and half closed her eyes. One eyebrow raised. It made her look cute in a 1940s screwball comedy kind of way. Pretty enough to be noticed, but not beautiful enough to be harassed for it. Even ugly girls get harassed these days. They probably like it more, she said. I doubt it. I really doubt that. He stood up. Let's get something to eat and reunite me with my baby. You shouldn't marry that ninja. Hey, she's Japanese. Would that count as one of those Asian mail-order brides? Okay, Slashaholics, this has been the prologue and chapter one of Final Destination, Destination Zero by David McKenty. I hope I'm saying that author's name right. If I'm not, and you know the proper way, please let me know. Uh, not a whole lot to say about this book yet. I do like how it did reference Dead Reckoning in the prologue. I mean, that is what it was referencing. Am I mistaken? For some reason, it feels like the name matched up and everything with the events of that book. If that is the case, that is a very cool thing that the author did with that to kind of give this some continuity. Uh, either way, I did enjoy his writing style in this prologue. Uh, we've been introduced to several new characters. Not a whole lot to go off yet uh, as far as like what I think of them, but I'm curious to see uh, how this book is going to handle the uh, premonition... Uh, what the premonition is going to be of, like what the catastrophe is going to be. I really have no idea. I've heard a couple things about this book, uh, that at some point Jack the Ripper gets uh, referenced or something, that he has something to do with the book. Uh, not, a, not entirely sure what that means. Um, if you've read this book before, uh, am I correct? Is Jack the Ripper referenced somewhere in this book later on? I would love to know if that's an accurate thing or not. Uh, I might be getting it mixed up with the other... Final Destination book that's coming uh, later on that I'll narrate, the last one remaining after this one, which is Final Destination End of the Line, as far as the original books go. And I'm still going to narrate Final Destination 1 and 2, the novelizations of the movies. Uh, let me know what you thought of the prologue in Chapter 1 of this book, if you're excited to hear the rest of it. 
and I'll be back very soon with more of Final Destination, Destination Zero. It's a lot of destination in there. Uh, by David McKinty. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and I'll see you soon. <laughs>